If you struggle with energy, if you struggle with not being able to go a few hours without eating, if you have no ability to fast, if you have really bad weight loss resistance, if you find yourself constantly on the glycemic roller coaster, if you just find yourself super exhausted after lunch, these are all signals that your body doesn't have proper energy flow. And if you have problems with mental illness, Hello, hello. I'm your host for today, Dr. Carrie Jones, and I am so excited to have Dr. Molly Maloof on. Dr. Maloof is quite the woman. She is a doctor. She's an educator. She's a speaker. She is the founder of Adamo Bioscience. She has also been an advisor to several tech startup biohacker companies, longevity companies, and she is the best selling author to The Spark Factor. I Love this book. When I got it in the mail, I read it start to finish. I took a bunch of notes. The reason is I am obsessed with mitochondria and the health of your mitochondria. Now, you may not realize what the mitochondria does, or maybe you haven't thought about it since, I don't know, grade school or middle school, when we were told that they were our batteries, our powerhouses, right? Our power cells. Did you know that you make hormones like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone in your mitochondria? It's actually the first step. It's the first and last step for your cortisol production. So if you're struggling with your hormones, if you're struggling with your energy, if you're feeling really low battery and you don't know quite how to put that into words or what to do, Dr. Molly walks us through the whole thing. She walks us through how to make more batteries, more uh, mitochondria. She walks us through what's hurting our mitochondria. She walks us through inflammation in the mitochondria, stress in the mitochondria, our gut in the mitochondria, and then what we can do, most importantly. So listen up, because you're going to learn a lot. Dr. Molly Maloof, welcome to the Root Cause Medicine podcast. I am so excited to talk about your book, The Spark Factor, because anything about the mitochondria just gets me giddy. I love reading about it, and your book from start to finish had such great information that I know everyone listening is just going to freak out over. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a labor of love over many years to write this book. Really hard to translate, you know, core science into approachable content, but I've got a lot of great feedback on it. So it's been really a fun journey. Well, it was when it was sent to me, I read the whole thing cover to cover. And I was like this, this is such a great guidebook, handbook. It's exactly what we get as questions on the podcast. And I think those people who buy it, male or female, it honestly either is going like, to really help it. So before we get into like, why did you write the book or how did you start the book? I want to ask the most simple question is if somebody's listening to this and they're like, well, how would I know this applies to me? Like, how do I have a mitochondria problem first? What am I listening for? And then we'll kind of get to that nitty gritty. Well, keep in mind that in America, only... 12% of the population has metabolic has good metabolic health. So there's a really good chance that you're one of those people that doesn't. And many people go years without realizing they have problems until the end of the diagnosis of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or even mental illnesses. And what we're discovering is that, you know, it's funny, I had this conversation a few days ago with a physician who was retired and became an investor. And he was just saying, look, the entire approach to medicine through thinking everything is genetic is an old theory. And the new concept that's coming out is energy deficiency precedes disease. And so metabolic diseases, people like me believe are underneath the majority of chronic illnesses in our country. And so if you you struggle with energy, if you struggle with not being able to go a few hours without eating, if you have no ability to fast, if you have really bad weight loss resistance, if you find yourself constantly on the glycemic roller coaster, If you just find yourself like super exhausted after lunch, these are all signals that your body doesn't have proper energy flow. And if you have problems with mental illness, like we're learning that there's a lot of mental, there's a great book by Christopher Palmer called Brain Energy. And it's basically the same book I wrote, except we're written from the perspective of a psychiatrist. And what he's claiming is that metabolic dysfunction perceived mental illnesses, not all of them, but many of them. And so we really need to start looking at energy dysregulation as the biggest issue and that these chronic illnesses are the end result of cellular health basically being damaged by our lifestyles. So basically, what does that mean? That means that people who don't move their bodies, which is most people, people who sit around all day, people who eat all day, people who have stress all day long, people who don't get proper time outside, most people are living all of their time indoors. All of these things are out of alignment with our genetic design, which is we are literally designed for 
outdoor interactivity with nature, heat and cold cycles, light and dark cycles, you know, feasting and fasting cycles, exercise and recovery cycles, and stress and recovery cycles. And like, we now have this totally different landscape of an existence. And if you actually just look at the way that our cells work under natural condition versus current condition, what we end up with is energy excess, insufficient exercise, sending in insufficient signals to the cells to make more energy. Stress is basically battery drain. So you're literally draining the batteries. And then lack of close personal relationships, loneliness is actually worse for your health than smoking, drinking, sedentary behavior, and obesity. Because literally it's the ultimate safety signal and stress reduction intervention that you can have. So it's no surprise that everyone's so sick. It's no surprise that 88% of the country is metabolically unwell. So that's a long-winded answer to a very complicated subject. That's the truth. And one of the other things I just wanted to add, because it's close to home in my area that I love are hormones. You have a section here on hormones, how, you know, a lot of women, I mean, men included, but women will go to their practitioner with our hormone issue. And we know hormones are divas, hormones are dramatic. They're the canary in the coal mine. You know, they're coming in saying, I have PMS or I'm moody or I have cramps or my periods are weird or I can't get pregnant. So it's all these very relatable symptoms. And at the same time, as you mentioned in your book, hormones, believe it or not, are made in our mitochondria and, you know, require a lot of ATP. And, and so even just tying in, and then of course, all hormones all tie back into all the metabolic stuff that you just said. And you're, it's, you're right. It's the very few conventional practitioners. It's not what's taught. Like, oh, it's just, here's the birth control pill or, you know, here's this other prescription. It's symptom management. You know, it's like, let's just manage your symptoms and like get out of my office. But fundamentally, like when I started understanding mitochondria, I felt like I'd understood the nature of life. And like, if you look at Chinese medicine, if you look at Taoism, this concept of polarity is really important. And mitochondria are literally the create the place where we create energy polarity to create energy to create ele- basically electrochemical gradients, which are in scientific terms, bad capacitors. So a capacitor is like two different basically plates and there's different differential charge on each side and you can deploy energy quickly from a capacitor. Battery is when there's a membrane and there's differences in, in electrochemical gradients on each side. So you have a, you have a gradient of charge. And when I was like, okay, so now I understand physics, right? So this explains like how our cells function in terms of the lens of physics. But then when you start studying Taoism and you're like, okay, so like literally polarity is existent. How does polarity fit into mitochondria? Well, it turns out they play a role in the production of stress hormones and sex hormones. And we need healthy production of sex hormones to have healthy fertility, healthy mental health, healthy just overall cellular function. And when we get really highly stressed out, the body diverts resources into producing stress hormones. And so in the outer mitochondrial membrane, there's enzymes that catalyze the reaction of creating things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then Cortisol is also um, mediated through mitochondrial functioning. So basically the adrenals are just covered in mitochondria. They're like really dark looking organs. And when I realized that there was this relationship between stress and safety in the mitochondria, I felt like you could really tell the story of existence through these organelles. And if you trace them all the way back to primitive life, even single cellular life, the concept of the ability for us to evolve as a species began with this thing called the endosymbiotic hypothesis, which was that a long, 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 long time ago, many, 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 many millions of years ago, there was mostly single, single cellular organisms and they were able to engulf bacteria to enable them to harvest energy more effectively from the environment, which enabled them to evolve. So our capacity to harvest energy and to maintain healthy energy flow plays a massive role in our ability to survive and reproduce. And that was when, like, I come and clicked in my head and I was like, oh, so like, this is just fundamental to life. Like, this is just a fundamental facet of existence. And what a lot of people don't also know is that we are a holobiome. So we are a micro, we have, we have three different sort of genetic trees in our, in our body. We have our, our own personal genomes. And then we have our mitochondrial genomes from our mothers. And then we have, which by the way, are circular which are also, by the way, bacterial genomes are circular, which is kind of confirming the sort of evolutionary hypothesis that we evolved mitochondria from bacteria. But then we also have an entire gut and body covered in bacteria. 
And there's actually a lot of mitochondrial microbiome crosstalk that it, we're just now discovering. So if you have an inflamed gut, then that's going to send inflammation signals throughout your entire body, which is basically going to send signals to all of your cells that you're under threat. So it's so important that you recognize the role of food and nutrition and also like the role of your gut health and overall health, because all these things are communicating and talking together. And they also communicate with the brain through cellular, cellular signaling and through the vagus nerve. So it takes a long time to study all these different scientific you know, fields to really make sense of them all. But that's kind of my forte in, in life is like, I'm very multidisciplinary and I've always been this way. And I've always been interested in like, how do you piece together all these different facets of medicine into a coherent theory? And that's why I've dedicated the last 10 years of my life to understanding human health from a molecular level and also from a macro level. The other cool thing that people don't realize about mitochondria is that they actually have a lot of this similar behaviors as groups of people. So like they, they're not these like single little tiny beans in the cell that and also the, the picture you see in anatomy photos. It's like, no, mitochondria are actually like constantly fusing and there's a called fission and fusion, right? They're constantly coming together, communicating, sharing energy and information, and then breaking apart. And so this is like a constant flow of change that's adapting to the environment around around you. And one of the downsides of overeating is it actually disrupts the fission and fusion cycle, makes mitochondria less efficient, less, less effective at creating and storing charge. And another big problem with lack of exercise is you actually create more oxidative stress in the cell. You create more exhaust fumes in the cell because your cell is basically metabolizing fuel, but it's not going anywhere. So it's like, it's like a car sitting in a garage. You know, you're like blowing off all of this exhaust fume and it's not going anywhere. So it's just when you really start looking at the cellular health of your body as like you have a body that's designed to move. You have a body that's designed to connect. You have a body that's designed to really find energy and survive. And you have a body that's designed to reproduce. And we, we often like get so hung up on our mind and our thoughts and our existences and what's in the news. And we just like forget about this fundamental existence that we're living and how simple it actually is. And like we make it so complicated and it's not that complicated, actually. I mean, it just seems complicated because of all the messages we're taught. But the vast majority of what we see in the news and, and in advertising is basically trying to hijack these like primitive drives that we have in our bodies to survive and reproduce. And so if you want to be a healthy human in modern days, you have to learn to see through a lot of these societal messages that are basically encouraging you to live a life of convenience and excess. And lives of convenience and excess lead to shortened existences because you have damaged metabolic health and you have chronic disease. And one of the things I love, even though there are nutrient supplements, et cetera, that can be supportive, not once have you said, here's one magic pill, because you know people ask, what's the one pill that's going to help save my mitochondria? <laughs> If there was one pill, it just we wouldn't have this podcast wouldn't exist. We would just give out the pill all the time, and it'd be it'd be that easy. But you're not you're not asking for hard things, and you're not asking for expensive things. You know, it's practical and tactical to help these your body and the mitochondria function. Not once have you mentioned you know a ten thousand dollar test or something just completely out of the realm of a lot of people's budgets. It's honestly going back to a lot of the basics. It's really good. It's funny because someone was like, why do you need to know about mitochondria if you're just teaching the basics? And I was like, because if you understand mitochondria, you understand why you need the basics. And the thing is, the basics are not the same as just eat right and exercise more. It's like, how do I eat and exercise to optimize my mitochondrial health? So how do you get weightlifting and how do you balance that with a little bit of hit training? It's not like I'm recommending women go to these like 700 calorie an hour fitness you know, classes regularly, like that can actually damage mitochondria. So it turns out that you really shouldn't do HIIT training more than 90 minutes a week. And people who are going to like hours and hours of these like super intense HIIT training classes are actually damaging mitochondrial health. So it's not just about the simple, it's not just about the basics. It's about how do I tailor those basics to my life and my health? And I know a lot of people struggle with diet and exercise, but Building metabolic flexibility is not this straightforward thing that we are taught in school. It's like, of course, if you eat right and exercise, you'll be healthy. But I know people have gotten heart disease, even though they were exercising and eating vegan. 
Okay. And so you, it, it's not a guarantee that just because you eat right and exercise, you're not going to get chronic diseases. And by the way, even if you do eat right and exercise, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking under the hood occasionally and getting some labs done, especially if you're noticing the engine lights on. You know, like even every single great practitioner that I know who I would consider to be like an absolute like rock star had dealt with health issues. So the reason why you need these basics is because you're going to be way more able to fight health issues if they come up because you're going to have greater energy capacity to meet your demands. And so this is a... Another thing, right? It's like we have this definition of health that is that that is like, oh, it's this complete absence of disease and infirmary. My definition of health is based on this researcher, the Netherlands. Basically, they were trying to def- redefine health. And the redefinition that they came up with was the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of restraint. So another thing I would just like add is like, let's say you eat right and exercise perfectly, but you have unrelenting stress that screws up your immune system that necessitates you to take antibiotics that maybe ends up giving you COVID because you, or maybe you just get COVID a few times. You will, you can still get sick even if you're doing the right things because stress will affect your immune function and it will, stress will drain your batteries. So you can, you're, you're constantly adapting to the environment by creating more energy and using the energy. So, you know, just kind of like in a video game, if you're running on like low energy capacity and those lives are like, you've got like one like bar left, you can set yourself still up for disease. But that's where, that's when you should be doing some surveillance testing, you know, is if you start noticing like, you know, you start noticing like maybe joint pain or memory loss or, you know, like blood sugar dysregulation that's not being fixed by diet. You do need to start looking at some laboratory tests. But if you're generally healthy and you're looking to optimize and you feel really good most days, then getting to the gym consistently, having variable exercise is really key. You need, you need flexibility exercises. So like Pilates or yoga is great. You need weight, weight training. Pretty much everybody needs weight training because of bone density loss for all women as we age. Whether you are on hormones or not, you're still going to lose estrogen. And you're still going to change over time. So you really, it's a non-negotiable is, is weight training. And then cardio is the really fun one that a lot of people don't fully understand. So we need cardio for heart health, but continuous cardio as your only source of exercise is actually going to make your cells more likely to use less. It's like you create the conditions where you need your cells become really hyper efficient with, with fuel and it can actually like affect your metabolic rate. So like weight training will generally increase your metabolic rate and create, you know, more calorie burn at baseline. But Chronic cardio can sometimes even do the opposite, where you actually burn less calories at baseline because you're trying to get more efficient with what you've got. So that's why I don't usually recommend like high amounts unless you want to train. Like I, I may, I may want to do a triathlon at some point. If you're training for a triathlon, that's what you're doing. But keep in mind that you you do need to recognize that just continuous chronic cardio is is going to it's going to wear down your muscles by design. It's again you're going to get leaner. But you're also going to get, you're not going to get that full benefit of, of having strong muscle tone. And strong muscle tone is really key because your muscles are battery packs. They're basically a big power plant. So I think we're moving away from the era of chronic cardio as like the main source of exercise and really towards an era of like women looking at strength training as like necessary for longevity and avoiding falls. Like you don't want to die from a fall, you know, that, that, will, that will ruin your life. And I can't tell you the number of women I see that are like so focused on just like eating as little as possible and exercising as much as they can. And they're, and they're really unhappy, you know, like their, their brains aren't working properly. They're really lean, but they have no muscle tone. That is a recipe for bone density loss, falls, and a shortened lifespan. So like the, the real cool move where things are moving in diet and exercise is women realizing, oh, they called reverse dieting. I can actually eat more, exercise more, get a better body. What is that about, you know? And then also throwing in the fasting, right? So like I fasted on the flight home from Europe and on the way there. And people are like, how do you fast if you're like flying across the country? You know, like, like you know, even people, people are like, you're in business. Why don't you eat the food in business club? I'm like, you don't eat food on plate because plain food is microwaved. 
it's in plastic and you're in the air and you're also, your body doesn't know what time zone it is. If you want to avoid jet lag, fasting is a great tool in the toolbox. But also as you get older and you start hitting perimenopause in your 40s, learning how to fast is a great way to build metabolic flexibility. Learning how to do ketosis before you learn to fast is a great way to learn to fast so that you can actually drop into ketosis and be more metabolically flexible. So like I had eaten like a queen for a few weeks when I was in Europe and I had to be in a swimsuit. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do to get into a swimsuit in one week? Just go low carb, just go keto for like a week. And I can literally, I know when I'm in ketosis because I can smell ketones in my body. But you can lean out like that and then, you know, like phase carbs back in as you see fit. But this sort of like chronic high carb dieting is out. It's out. It's out. It's like <laughs> no longer cool to be eating a high carb diet, but it's also no longer really, really, really even necessary to eat a continuously keto diet as a woman. And I've seen women lose their hair. I've seen women lose their periods. I've seen women do so many things wrong with diet and exercise because they're following these fads and they're not thinking about how does the body adapt to different demands. So naturally, you would never see continuous amounts of food in primitive times. You'd have certain times where you'd be in ketosis and you'd have certain times where you'd be feasting. And so like my body responds best and stays fitter and healthier when I go in and out of ketosis, when I go in and out of, of higher and lower intensity exercise, when I go in and out of these, it's basically like sine waves, right? So like some weeks I'll eat higher carbs, some weeks I'll eat lower carb. Generally speaking, I eat lower carb in general because I am naturally more, I mean, I've become more insensitive to carbs as I've gotten older. But I'm also almost 40. I'm in 39 right now, you know. And even Gwyneth Paltrow, who used to be like a diehard macrobiotic eater, is like she shifted to paleo when she hit her 50s or late 40s or early 50s. And it's not surprising that you see this happen to women where they're like, oh, yeah, the diet I used to eat just doesn't work for me anymore. I had a friend who was vegan and she got pregnant and she was consistently anemic and she just could not maintain her iron levels and she started eating meat again. So like that's a whole nother discussion. but. I do think that we need to get away from these dogmatic lifestyles of like all plants, all animals, all high carb or a low carb, you know, chronic cardio or just weightlifting. And we need to start trying to think about how we are using using fuel and exercise as signal to the cells to become more to become more adapted to the demands placed upon us. So like during periods of high stress, I don't eat super low carb. <laughs> I eat much more moderately because I'm trying to send safety signals to my cells. I also don't do as much intense exercise when I'm under significant stress because I'm trying to give my body recovery. And it's like, I think it's tough for people to like, they want just an easy, simple answer. And the reason why I wrote this book is because it's not that easy to eat right and exercise. You know, like you have to actually build habits and skills and like getting into ketosis is not an overnight thing. You just learn how to do. It's like, it takes practice. It takes, you have to learn what foods are best for you. You have to learn what foods work for your body. You know, tuning your gut health is something that I've had to do many times in my life. And I'm constantly fixing my gut because I've got a weak gut from antibiotics as a child. And so my goal for people to read this book is to give them a philosophy of health to understand what it means to adapt to modern life and why understanding mitochondria can better help you adapt to modern existence. Imagine if we had learned these things a lot younger. You know, a lot of people are learning this for the first time as a full-grown adult. Sometimes in their fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life, like the, not even in their 20s or 30s trying to figure it out. I mean, I have often postmenopausal women who were like, I was never taught this. I didn't know this. And now I'm trying to learn this. Imagine if I had learned this as a teenager or grew up in a household like where this was readily taught or available. And I understand. I understand their frustration. And especially you mentioned perimenopause. And I want to circle back to that because that's a huge one in how it relates to metabolic health and mitochondria. I have so many patients that go, what is happening? I've changed nothing and everything's changing. I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, that. It's called your hormones. So I had a friend who was really struggling and She's actually got a, just a New York Times article with her face on the front of it on perimenopause. And I'm very proud of this story because basically she came to me and this is a person who has been so generous with her time with me. She has given me so much free advice on PR. She's an absolute maven in marketing. 
And there was a point of time where I needed, she needed my help. And she's like, Molly, something's wrong with me. I know something is up and I know that I need to change. I don't know what to do, but something's wrong with my health. And I'm like, hey, first step, put a blood sugar monitor on. Let's just see what your blood sugar looks like. I've been using these since 2014 and I wasn't even healthy at 2014. That was like, you know, almost nine years ago, nine years ago. Right. And I mean, I was borderline pre-diabetic and holy crap. Right. If I'm, and I was just starting my career thinking I was trying to, I mean, literally it's funny. Like people always ask me like, well, Molly, you've always been so healthy. Absolutely not. Like I, I got into this career because I've always struggled with my health since I was a child. I was the one person in my family who was always sick. I was the one person in my family who was always getting burned out. I was always struggling with something. And I felt like I was in the doctor's office all the time. And I didn't understand. And I remember being in seventh grade being like, someday I'm just going to understand all this. I, re- I was going through puberty. And I remember thinking, someday I'm going to make sense of all of this change. And it's been a lifelong journey of literally trying to fix so many of my own problems. I've had to fix period issues. I've had to fix ADHD. I've had to fix acne. I've had to fix, you know, like gut dysfunction. I have had, I have celiac and, you know, like even now I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, um, I got some, some lab results and I'm like, cool, new area to optimize. And so I'm constantly trying to improve because I, I, I didn't get the right cards as a person. I didn't get great cards, you know, for health. And so I am basically a living walking testament that like you can change your health because I was not healthy. I was incredibly imbalanced in my 20s. I had all sorts of unresolved psychological issues and trauma that I had never dealt with, largely dissociated. Like I just was not a healthy human when I started my practice. I was thinking I was. And I was, but I knew deep down that my mission and purpose was to pursue what I thought was health because I was like, medicine is teaching me disease and everyone I know in medicine is sick. All these doctors I work with are ill. I don't want to be them. I want to be somebody who gets healthier and healthier every year. And I looked at my life and I said, if I commit to this path and I believe in this path of optimizing health, then by the time 10 years goes by, I'm going to be healthier, happier, fitter, stronger, faster than all my peers. And I I, I honestly, I have to say, like, it was a massive bet to place to say, I'm going to try to build a medical practice around building healthier people. And I'm going to try to build a career around optimizing health and using technology and data and labs to like guide better decision making. But what it's done is it's actually created, I mean, it's blossomed into this like amazing existence that I get to live today, which is like pretty, 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 you know, having cool. Now, Celia comes along, circle back to her story. And she's like, you seem so healthy. What is your secret? I'm really struggling. I need some help. And I said, look, I've been wearing a blood sugar monitor for almost 10 years now. And if it, if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. So if you, if I can be borderline pre-diabetic, you probably are too. So she puts on a blood sugar monitor and she's like, holy crap, I am hitting regularly above 140 after meals. And my fasting blood sugar is not good. And I'm like, you know what? Like it, call it medical intuition or just call it like statistics. Most people are dealing with metabolic issues and they don't even know it. And there are doctors on TikTok that argue with me and then send me message. And they're like, these blood sugar spikes, they are not bad for you. I'm like, do you have any, have you done any homework on what oxidative stress does to blood vessels? Have you done any research on blood sugar dysregulation and heart disease? Like, do you realize that like high blood sugar levels are damaging to beta cells? And they just look at me like I'm crazy. And they're like, where's the research? Where's the research? I'm like, here's the research. And they, and then I show them the research and they're like, that's not good enough research. And I was like, okay, you know what? I've been ahead of the curve on so many things for so many years that I just no longer argue with people that are from the mainstream because I'm just like, look, you guys are 15 years behind half the stuff that I do. And I don't, I'm not here to, to, to like, to bring you to the other side, like whether either you're, or you are interested or you're not. And I'm very much based on see for yourself, know for yourself. So like for me and for my clients, Getting their blood sugar regulated has been so phenomenal for optimizing hormones, optimizing health. In Celia's case, it completely resolved her perimenopausal symptom and gave her brighter skin, gave her a better relationship with food. And, you know, now she became accidentally the poster child for perimenopause. 
And the real, the real thing was like, it's actually blood sugar because when your hormones decrease as you go into your forties, you basically have less estrogen. And with less estrogen, you have less insulin sensitivity. And so it's really, really, really important for people to realize this because you can do everything right, but also like see your hormones change and then be like, what's, where's the belly coming from? You know, and it's fixable, but you know, there are a lot of companies that are, that are coming out in the next five years that are literally addressing perimenopause head on. But if you don't address blood sugar, then you're not going to fix everything. It's, it's not enough to just take hormones. You still have to look at your diet and, you know, like I now, I mean, I love, I love the way, I mean, I eat, you know, pretty, pretty strict diet, but it's because I like the way it makes me feel like I like having balanced blood sugar. I like having, and I eat fruit and I eat carbs, but I am very careful with, with food timing, with food order, with food quality and, you know, vegetables, protein first, carbs last. I went through a phase during the pandemic where I kind of reintroduced, I, I let myself kind of slack off a little bit with like fried food and sugar. And I am like back on this. I mean, like it's taken me some time, but you can't eat, eat those things are bad, right? Like I, I have to, I have to keep reminding myself and others like, yeah, you're going to, you're going to drop off and then you have to get back on the saddle. You know, you're, you're going to fall off the horse. And like, even I'm not perfect. Okay. Like I, even I am not a human like that is perfect. I used to be borderline orthorexic. And I realized that like, you definitely don't want to be so obsessed with like that you can't enjoy your life. But you have to look at these foods as like occasional treats, not like every time you have a burger, you get fries. You know, like the thing about fries is that they're cooked in rancid oils. Those oils are highly oxidized. That oxidization does damage the mitochondria. And so, you know, over time, the number, it's not, it's not the, it's the dose that's the poison, right? So it's like what fries a few times a year and they're going to kill you. Fries every week is it really going to add up over a long period of time? And that and those fats get assimilated into your body, into your brain. And I mean, oftentimes it's like a health scare that gets you back into, you know, into what you're trying to do properly. But it's hard to change behavior. You know, it, the best thing you can do is start working on one single habit at a time. Do a sugar cleanse for a month, you know. One, it, it, maybe just try to meet the you know, American Heart Association goals for sugar, which is less than 25 grams a day. To me, like, I try to avoid sugar as much as possible. And if I am going to eat a food that has sugar in it, I try to aim for products that have less than five grams of, of sugar added because you can easily add those up over time, right? Like that would be like no more than five servings of food that with five, you know, 10 for me, like 10 grams of sugar in one sitting is going to spike my blood sugar, but I eat low carb. So I'm not going to be as adapted to eating sugar as an average person. So I have to be more careful with it. But, you know, you learn a lot by just putting a blood sugar monitor on. And keep in mind, these are expensive right now, but they're going to get cheaper and they're going to get way more widely available. And then before you know it, Apple's going to have these in the watches and everyone's going to have information. Yeah, for sure. I was so happy with pretty much the only sugar I eat is dark chocolate, you know, 80% or higher. And somebody was making, they were like, you know, chocolate's going to affect your blood sugar, all this stuff. And I said, well, mine doesn't. I literally, I have a, I have a CGM in. Hey, I have an 80, you know, when I have 88%, a square or two of chocolate, like my little blood sugar line just stays nice and level, which is nice because it's, you know, the levels app that tells me. <laughs> and so I just tell people, you know, and you're going to react to different things like sweet potatoes. Some people can do well with some, a little bit of sweet potato. Not me. I go through the roof. So sweet potatoes are the occasional in Thanksgiving when I just don't care, I know. And, but it's, I was shocked. I thought, oh, I thought it was the starchier carb. I thought it was, you know, the veg. No, 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 no. My, no, my blood sugar metabolism, age, all the things was like, no, that's rice is the absolute worst. But you're in denial if you put the CGM on and then you're like, dang it. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's one of those things where I just wish everybody had them all the time. Because if you were wearing this constantly, you would just have this information. And it's hard to remember it all, you know? Like, it's hard to, like, remember, oh, yeah, these are the things that I shouldn't be doing. But, like, I put them, I'm, when I, once I get back home next week, I'll be putting another one on again. And I try to use them, like, quarterly because it's, like, it's, it's kind of like a tune-up. It's like, okay, where am I at with this? Like, where, you know, what, what do I need to work on? What do I not need to work on? But having a healthy relationship with food 
I mean, honestly, if you're one of those people like me at this point where you finally have a healthy relationship with food, like consider that to be a massive achievement because the vast majority of women in particular really have a pretty poor relationship with food. And there's so much anxiety associated with eating. And it's really a shame because food is one of the most wonderful facets of being human. And we definitely really just as a culture have this very, 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 very challenging relationship with how we nourish ourselves, which says a lot about being a female. You know, it's like, this is literally your birthright. It's like your ability to nourish yourself and nourish others is part of your purpose of being. And that's how backward modern life has become, is that we've like been so conditioned to believe that like eating makes us fat or makes us less valuable as people because we're not super duper skinny. It's such a shame, you know, like there was this article in the, in the Wall Street Journal that was like about how it's an economic advantage to be, to be thin. And, you know, that means it's an economic disadvantage to be fat. And that sucks, you know, like that super sucks that we have that kind of culture. So, you know, for me during the pandemic, what really, I was certainly struggling during the pandemic because I was isolated for a few months and I was just like really struggling with food. And I remember thinking to myself, there was a moment where I was like trying to reach for food when I was feeling emotionally, it, it was feeling lonely. And I remember thinking, no amount of food is going to fix the way I feel. And that feeling of realization of like, oh, I can't fix this feeling by food was like a big realization for me. And that was what led me to like reaching out and seeing family and friends and just, you know, moving away from the isolation perspective. But I think it's so important to ask yourself regularly, like, am I feeding myself from, from fear and from anxiety and from loneliness? Or am I feeding myself because I want to nourish my body? And feeding yourself from a place of nourishment and, and self-love and caring for yourself is such a satisfying place to be. Yeah. And and I was to say, I know when, and I'm sure you've had these conversations, I know I have, when people hear this about CGMs, blood sugar, or food, um, it can be very triggering to their food addictions, to their thoughts, to their beliefs. And I completely understand that. And I understand why. I have a history of disordered eating myself when I was a lot younger. And so I always just ask people, you know, well, actually... We are actually trying to get you to live longer, be less inflamed, you know, protect your hearts, get into perimenopause and menopause really well. Like, like it's, it's for the greater good of you. I mean, we mentioned you know, for sure we mentioned weight, but it's but it's also a lot of the conversation is cr longevity. A lot of the conversation is the ability to not break a bone. The, you know, a lot of the conversation is to grow older and thrive, which hopefully a lot of people want to do as opposed to just thinking we're only talking about you have to be skinny. It's like, wow, I hope you didn't take that from this whole conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's really about nourishment. You know, it's about getting food that nourishes your cells and gives you the ability to thrive and flourish, you know? Absolutely. Well, the last question I want to ask you is around endocrine disrupting chemicals in the mitochondria because that's a huge one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as someone who's used way too many beauty products in her life, I'm starting to really understand that I can no longer get these nails done. You know, like I started getting them done during like the last, you know, year really, because I started, you know, it was like the pandemic is kind of over. People were starting to date again. But this friend of mine who runs a, a laboratory testing company, he's like, you know, those things damage your, your hormones, right? And I was like, man, I really needed to hear that. I really need to hear that. But the cool thing is that actually natural nails, well, these are my nails, actually. They're just painted. But natural nails are actually getting to be cooler again. Like, it, like so shorter natural nails are kind of in. And they are making more and more nail polishes that are non-toxic. But at the end of the day, like, I think what I'm heading towards is like natural just buffed nails. Because... um we do need to examine like all the chemicals in our environment and where they're coming from. And like receipts are another big one. A lot of people handle receipts and they're, they've got BPA. BPA is an endocrine disruptor. One of my friends recently released a TED talk that got banned and it was about coffee cup lid and how they release BPA. And then like there's a bunch of research on like people microwaving plastics and, le and like, and there's like water bottles leaching chemicals, you know? And it's like, it's a lot of work to avoid chemicals in our in our food, in our environment. 
I mean, it's one of the reasons why I try not to eat out very often, because when you eat out, you're literally getting food packaging. Your food's in food packaging. And those food packaging, they don't care. They just want the cheapest product to put, to put you know, to put food in. So like, learn to cook. Make your kitchen your medicine cabinet. You know, like my kitchen at home is like very, very, very much like a, like, it's like a laboratory. You know, I've got my notes. And I've got my smoothie ingredients. I've got my foods and I've got a whole drawer in my fridge of random health optimization tools. And so there's just a lot more that you can do with your own kitchen than you realize. And it's a lot more affordable. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. Hands down. Well, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. As I said, I read your book, The Spark Factor, cover to cover. You have just been a wealth of knowledge. You've just data dumped all the studies. You've, you've gone over in the last 47 minutes and I really appreciate that. So let everyone know, like, where can they find you? Where can they get the book? Where can they follow you and learn more? Yeah. At drmolly.co on Instagram is the best place to follow me or TikTok. And then www.drmolly.co, my website, you know, drmolly.co. And then you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Molly Maloof MD. And yeah, that's the best place to, to find me. Amazing. Amazing. And do you also, for the CGM, do you want to let people know about that? Yeah. So levels.link backslash Dr. Molly is my levels if you want to cut the line and get a CGM. And then I'll also add that I'm launching a new company and it's called Living Adamo. Well, that website's called livingadamo.com, but Adamo is the name of the company. And we are pioneering the first sex therapy since Masters and Johnson. And so, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So like with the whole, the the end of my book really ends on love and connection because the biggest factor driving longevity and happiness is close personal relationships. So I decided to start a company around the science of love and we are developing a new sex therapy for, first we have a, a therapy for couples and then we're also developing a therapy for singles. But we are looking for sex therapists that want to get trained for couples who want to be part of our first cohort. We're even running a clinical study in October around this method. So it's a big, I wouldn't say it's a full left turn for what I've been doing, but it's definitely kind of like if, if health is really about, you know, nutrition and metabolism on one end and connection, then that's, you know, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm emphasizing connection as my next sort of decade goal. Oh my gosh, I love that. Well, we will, of course, have both those links, the levels links, all of Dr. Molly's links and the livingadamo.com in the show notes. So again, Dr. Molly, thank you so much for being on the Root Cause of Medicine podcast. I absolutely am so grateful. Thank you, Carrie. Awesome. You have a great day.